So welcome back from the break. Let's take a look at this question very quickly. Compare red algae and brown algae. So what do red algae have that brown algae don't have? What do red algae have that brown algae do have? Well, both are algae, both have chloroplasts that are derived from the endosymbiosis of the cyanobacterium. So the one thing that they do have in common is chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B as the primary electron, primary photosynthetic um, pigments. Brown algae have glyco, Hmm. Glycobilin, if I remember correctly, is the pigment that's found in brown algae. I think I said that before, and I'm pretty confident that, that I'm correct in that. Phycobilin and also um, some carotenoids that are more brown than yellow in color are the accessory pigments. Brown algae is a marine algae that is large in size. It grows close to the surface of the ocean within the first 100 feet or so of the water column. It doesn't grow below that. Um, it is completely dependent on red light and blue light for photosynthesis, but most of that is carried out by the portion of the brown algae that floats near the surface. Brown algae are the largest of the algae. They grow in the splash zone or the surf zone where the waves are breaking. Red algae, on the other hand, use phycoerythrin, a red pigment, they can grow deeper in the water column, so they can grow below 100 feet. Um, blue light is the light is the wavelength of light that penetrates that far, hence the need for a pigment that absorbs it. So a pigment that reflects red light that absorbs blue light is perfect. Phycoerythrin serves that purpose. Red algae. <coughs> um, if they grow near the surface, um, rely more on the chlorophyll, so they have a very dark green appearance if they're growing within the first 30 feet of the ocean. Um, but they can grow as far as 250 feet deep. At that stage, they become parasitic rather than photosynthetic, and they are black in color. They are truly black in color. Um, they lack the photosynthetic pigments. You also have red algae that um, reinforce their um, cell walls using calcium carbonate. These are the coralline red algae. Those are the ones that grow, tend to grow somewhat deeper in the water rather than near the surface. So there are some comparison points for brown algae and red algae. So the final supergroup is the group Uniconta, so named because they have a single flagellum in, on the flagellated um, or in the fat flagellated stage. There are two clades within Uniconta, the amoebozoans, which are the classic amoebas, and the epistocons. And the epistocons contain both the, the protist ancestors of the animals and fungi, and also the animals and fungi as clades as well. We will talk about the um, protist relatives of the animals and the fungi when we do those chapters later in the semester. But we will talk about the amoebozoans in more detail because they are of interest here. So let's take a look at the amoebozoans. So within the amoebozoans, we have the slime molds, the tubulinids, which are not um, covered in the latest edition of the textbook, but I put in the notes that I have. I'm not sure why they dropped the, the, the tubulinids or they move them around. They've got a small paragraph. I shouldn't say they dropped them. They've only got a very small paragraph on the tubulinids. And then the entamoebas. So the tubulinids are the classic um, non-parasitic um, free living, um, amoebas, and then the entamoebas are the parasitic amoebas that make you very sick and can potentially kill you. Um, very nasty group of amoebas. Um, then we've got the nuclearids is the closest protist relatives of the fungi, the quanoflagellates, the, the, clo the, close, uh, the closest parasite relatives of the animals. I'm not going to really address those here. But we do want to look at the slime molds, the tubulinids, and the entamoebas. But before we get to that, um, 
the Unicanta create a lot of controversy as to the origin of the eukaryotic tree. And the reason why is because of an observation of a pair of genes that were inherited from bacteria. These are the dihydrofolate reductase gene or DHFR gene as it's labeled in the diagram and the thymidylate synthase gene otherwise labeled as the TS gene in the diagram. If we take a look at the nature of the DHFR TS gene pair in prokaryotes, these are two separate genes. And so likely were two separate genes in the common ancestor of all eukaryotes. Why? Because in the uniconta, these two genes remain as separate genes. But in the other three clades, excavator, the sarclade, and the archiplastid of the DHFR and TS genes have fused to create a single gene complex. Now, you can't really build a phylogenetic tree on the basis of a single gene sequence analysis. But in the last five to 10 years, with the advent of gene sequencing machines and the access to, or the ability to sequence more genes significantly more quickly, um, it's possible to sequence, it's been possible to sequence a lot more genes. So there are 30, 39 genes, sorry, that are known to have been transferred by horizontal gene transfer from the bacterial precursor to mitochondria to the eukaryotic genome in the nucleus. And those genes have now been studied across um, the four supergroups of the eukaryote, of eukaryotes. And that has simply reinforced the fact that excavator SAR and Archiplastida do form a single clade that diverge separately from a common ancestor that in turn diverged separately from the common ancestor of all eukaryotes. In other words, Uniconta as a clade really did emerge, did diverge first from the common ancestor population of all eukaryotes as a separate clade representing the basal um, clade to the phylogenetic tree of all eukaryotes. So the controversy is a little bit less, but there are still people who are not yet satisfied that this is in fact the phylogenetic tree of all eukaryotes. But at least we have a phylogenetic tree now that is not built on a single gene analysis, but on the analysis of multiple genes, which means that this is a more highly supported hypothesis than it was in the past. So that being said, let's take a look at the amoebozoan. So we've got the tubulinids, the entamoebas, and the slime molds. Looking at the slime molds or mycetozoa, there are two basic groups of slime molds. And you can see by the, the term mycetozoa that these were once considered to be fungi. They are not anymore. They are accepted as being um, protists and specifically members of the amoebozoa. There are two types of slime molds. There are the plasmodial slime molds, and as you'll see shortly, there are cellular slime molds. And this, is, this distinction is based on what is the feeding form of the two slime molds during their life cycle. So rather than talk about the life cycle, let me show you a diagram of the plasmodial slime mold um, life cycle. This is not found in the textbook. For some reason, they dropped this picture from the textbook. So unfortunately, you'll have to look in the PowerPoint to find the slide. You'll have to look here. Not sure why they dropped this diagram. Anyway, the feeding form of the plasmodial slime mold is a multinucleated large plasmodial mass. So this is not divided up into individual cells, rather the nuclei divide by mitosis, but the, plasm, the cytoplasm does not, no cytokinesis. So you get this large, extensive, highly threaded plasmodial mass that penetrates into the food source that it's utilizing to phagocytose um, food particles, and then by cytoplasmic streaming, distribute that to the whole of the body of the plasmodial mass. 
when it's time to reproduce, it, produce, it produces these um, structures called sporangia. Sometimes they're referred, referred to as fruiting bodies, but they're more correctly referred to as sporangia. Within the sporangia, ne um, meiosis is going to occur to give rise to the spores that we will be produced, and the spores are haploid. So out of the haploid spores um, emerges a amoeboid haploid cell that can migrate through the environment, as long as the environment is moist enough to support the amoeboid cell. If it's too dry, um, the spore doesn't germinate and it maintains its integrity because it's surrounded by a hydrophobic coating that's environmentally resistant. Once the amoeboid cell emerges, however, the type of environment that it encounters depends on what happens to it. If it remains moist enough to support, to support the amoeboid cell, it will stay in its amoeboid form. However, if it gets moister, it will transition to a flagellated cell. And this will swim through the more moist environment. If it starts to dry out again, it will transition back to the amoeboid cell. So we can move backwards and forwards between the flagellated stage and the amoeboid stage. Eventually, two of these cells encounter each other and fuse to allow the haploid nuclei to fuse. This gives rise to the diploid zygote that then becomes the basis for the plasmodium. This grows, the, site, the plasmodial mass, the cytoplasmic mass continues to grow. The nuclei or the nucleus divides by mitosis, creating this large plasmodial multinucleated nucleated feeding stage. And notice the nuclei are diploid. So those are the plasmodial slime molds. The ones that are really curious, however, are the cellular slime molds. So Dictyostelium discoidium, a classic cellular slime mold has been heavily studied because these guys blur the line between what it means to be unicellular and multicellular. And they've become the basis for research in trying to figure out how multicellularity emerged. So let's take a look at their life cycle and talk a little bit about them. So, they're called cellular slime molds because the feeding stage is individual haploid amoebas. So the haploid amoebas figure in the life cycle here, but they are the dominant stage in the life cycle. This is how it feeds as individual haploid cells. If they are going to reproduce sexually, then these cells will fuse together form a zygote, undergo meiosis, and release haploid amoebas back into the environment again. So nothing really unusual there, but it's the asexual reproductive strategy that is the curious one here. When the environment starts to turn hostile, which typically means loss of a food resource, and it's starting to dry out, the cells start to send out sexual attractants or attractive molecules, pheromones, and all the amoebas clump together to form a migrating slug. And they cooperate as a migrating slug to migrate to a new location. So they transition from individual um, unicellular amoebas into a multicellular cooperative group of haploid cells, this migrating slug that migrates to a new location. Then out of this, um, through cooperation, um, forms a stalk that becomes a rigid structure as the cells start to dry out. The cells at the top remain um, fully hydrated, and these are the cells that will eventually give rise to the spores that represent the reproductive stage in this asexual reproductive strategy. Those spores then are released if they find a suitable environment, amoeboid haploid cells emerge out of this to become the next group of feeding cells. 
Now, for a long time, this was thought to be a cooperative strategy, but it's now recognized that mutations occur that differential that lead to the cooperating cells, sometimes referred to as non-cheater cells, because they're cooperating with each other, versus a group of cells that are now referred to as cheating cells because they cheat the other cells by refusing to cooperate. And as a consequence, those are the cells that typically wind up in the, in the top of the fruiting body and have a greater chance of reproducing and therefore transmitting their genes into the next generation of feeding amoebas. And so one would ask, why do some of these cells become cheaters and other cells not? Why don't they all become cheaters if they have an increased chance of reproducing if they're cheating cells? And the answer is because the lack of this cheating mutation means that the non-cheating cells preferentially interact with other non-cheating cells and preferentially refuse to interact with the cheating cells, which means that the non-cheating cells are going to form the stalk because they're cooperating with each other, but that simply increases the chance of the non-cheating cells or, or promotes the chance of the non-cheating cells winding up in the fruiting bodies because the non-cheating cells are not going to cooperate with them. But the, non, the cheating cells don't care because they don't want to cooperate either. And they're going to climb up into the fruiting body and reproduce. So what is creating this cooperation? A multicellular, multicellular cooperative structure. It appears to be a mutation in a single gene that is the result of this. There's obviously a lot more research that needs to be carried out here to sort out what's going on with this um, transition from individual cells, unicellular life to cooperative life. But um, at least we're starting to get some hint as to what may be the evolutionary origin of multicellularity and cooperation between cells. Then the tubulinates are the classic non-lethal um, amoebas living in fresh water and in marine environments and also in the soil. These are non-threatening to organisms. They don't parasitize. They just simply hunt and consume bacteria and other protists as they encounter them in the environments that they're living in. The same cannot be said for the ent amoebas. So ent amoeba histolytica causes amoeboid dysentery, which can be lethal if left untreated. There's also another um, condition that we have here in Florida called amoeboid So parasitic amoebas. Cause amoeboid. I'm trying to remember what, what the name is. I don't think it's encephalitis. I wanted to say encephalitis, but I don't think it's amoeboid encephalitis. I'm trying to remember the name of the fluid that surrounds the spinal column in the brain. I'm having a, a blank. Anyway, um, let me talk about the disease and see if I can remember what what the name is, um, and I'll come back and, and put it in, if I remember. Anyway, these amoeba thrive in shallow bodies of fresh water where it's very warm. And we have those in Florida in our lakes, 
We also have them across the Southwest, Texas, Arizona, um, California. And basically what happens is that if you get water forcibly driven up your nose into the sinus cavities or they enter in through the ear canals and find a way to get into the brain case, which is where the problem begins. The amoebas um, set up shop there and very quickly cause the brain to swell. And within the space of 24 to 48 hours um, after infection, you're dead. In fact, many times um, it's already too late to go to the emergency room by the time you've got the infection, the damage has already been done. Um, and in a typical year, two or three people um, across the Southwest of the United States get infected and in the past, it's been a lethal condition. There are, however, a couple of experimental drugs that are now available. And the CDC and the FDA have agreed to release those experimental drugs while they're still in the process of clinical trials in an emergency situation upon application to the regulatory bodies. And I know about three years ago, there was a young boy here in Orlando that got infected with these amoebas. Um, and they made the request to the FDA and the, and the CDC to make these drugs available. The, the um, CDC and FDA said yes, the drugs were immediately flown to um, Orlando and, and, and administered to the young boy and he survived, he got them in time. So there is hope for the future, but if you go swimming in these lakes in summer or you go water skiing, you increase your chance of getting one of these amoeba infections if you face plant into the water and the water gets driven forcibly up your nose and enters the sinus passages because there are minor fractures in the bone all the time and that provides the the path for the amoebas to climb up into the brain case and infect the fluid um, and set up the infection and your brain case is a really um, nice place for um, the amoebas to grow. And I've just remembered what the fluid's called. It's called meningeal fluid, and the infection is called a meningitis. So it's amoeboid meningitis. So there is a bacterial version of meningitis, and that's the one that you can get vaccinated again. And often, um, if you go to a residential university campus or college campus, you're required to get the vaccination against the bacterial meningitis because it runs riot in um, college dorms um, or it used to before the vaccine was developed. Um, but in this case, there is no um, vaccine against it. Um, and as I said, um, you have a very short window of time between infection and lethality because it, it, the symptoms show up just about the time it's too late to cure the, the condition. But there are drugs that are now available and on request, the FDA and the CDC will make them available. So those are the entomoebas, not a nice group of organisms. Then we have the epistocons. As I said, we'll cover the... Um, Protists that are associated with animals and fungi when we do those chapters later in the semester. So one more concept check and then we're done. So compare the pseudopodia of amoebozoans and forams. Well, amoebozoans produce the chunky, broad extensions of the cytoplasm that are classic of amoebas. Forams produce the very thin extensions, sometimes referred to as axopodia, um, because they have to, to extend their pseudopodia through the little holes in the tests, the shells. So they can't produce the big chunky extensions that we associate with classic amoebas. They are both used for feeding. Um, the big extensions of amoebas surround the food particles and phagocytose them that way. In the case of the forams, it's a little bit more delicate. There's more of an 
a form of phagocytosis that looks a little bit more like pinocytosis or um, receptor mediated phagocytosis. So if those two terms do not sound familiar to you, well, number one, um, hopefully you did learn them in bio one, but if you can't remember them, number two, please go back and take a look at chapter seven um, in your bio one textbook and familiarize yourself again with the three types of phagocytosis because they're all important. Then slime molds are sometimes referred to as fungus animals. Why can this be both appropriate and not appropriate? Well, like a fungus, um, slime molds uh, penetrate into the food resource and feed by phagocytosis and absorption. Um, particularly in the case of the plasmodial slime mold, they produce these thin extensions that penetrate into the food resource and allow them to um, feed um, on the food resource and maximize absorption. And like an animal, they can get together as a multicellular cooperative multi um, migrating cell mass, the migrating slug, to move from one location to another. Why is this inappropriate? Because unlike um, now I've lost my train of thought again because I had a really good um, way of expressing why it's not appropriate. Yeah. Um, because unlike animals, um, they do not spend their life as um, diploid. Yeah, diploid um, organisms, and their reproductive strategy is very different in terms of reproducing through single haploid cells, their feeding stage, their dominant stage is single haploid cells, and they reproduce um, in, different in different ways to the animals. So they're not necessarily animal-like in everything that they do. They have some fungus characteristics, they have some animal, animal characteristics, but they also have characteristics that are separate from both. So that, uh, that is the protist. As you can see, a very, very diverse group of organisms and no surprise as to why the kingdom protista no longer exists and can't be supported. Um, and by the way, we've only really just scratched the surface of the diversity of protists. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot more complex than what, we've, what I presented um, in this presentation. But, it gets you at least a taste of what the protists are like. So if you have any concerns, comments, or questions about anything that I've covered in this presentation, by all means, contact me by email, come to office hours, whatever works for you. Um, in the meantime, be safe, and I'll see you back here again next time when we begin the first of two chapters talking about the plants. See you then.